nomine Padris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. For today, we celebrate the feast of Saint Mary Magdalene uh, de Pazzi. Uh, she was an Italian saint, a mystic, uh, born in Florence to a noble family uh, about in the year 1566. Uh, she is one, um, one of those, we'd say, like I said, uh, mystics of the church, um, contemporary uh, at the time of Saint Teresa of Avila and Saint John of the Cross. Uh, those are all in, within the uh, 16th century, the 1500s of the church. So uh, she, as a young girl, uh, was very pious, and at age nine, uh, we are told that she learned to meditate from her family's confessor. And he taught her to meditate specifically upon the passion of Christ, uh, which she did so with uh, great, um, uh, we could say, earnestness. Uh, she wanted to become a nun, and let's see, she made uh, her first Holy Communion at the then young age of 10 years old, and then like something like a month later, she took a perpetual vow of virginity. Probably didn't even know what that was, but she knew it was a good thing, and so she took it. Um, she was supposed to be married, right? Supposed to be, um, again, part of the noble family in Italy, was gonna have this, this life and this, this career and then so on, or this, this family, uh, but she wanted to have nothing to do with it. So she petitioned um, uh, her father to allow her to enter a, um, a convent, and finally he relented um, And when she was at the age of 16. And she chose a particular uh, Carmelite convent because um, this, this particular convent had the unusual practice of allowing uh, the, some of the nuns to receive Holy Communion uh, up to every single day. It was very unusual at the time, uh, so she chose that one specifically. Um, very um, early on, uh, she began to have uh, quite mystical experiences, ecstasies, visions of our Lord. Um, uh, and, and these started uh, when she became very ill. With, within a year of entering the convent, uh, she, she became deathly ill. It was thought she was not going to survive. And so she petitioned and received special permission to make her vows early. Right? She wanted to die as a fully professed Carmelite nun. So it was, it was given, and she ended up um, living for an, another oh, like 20 years. Uh, but that's when she began to have those, those mystical ecstasies. Um, and it, usually they would last. Um, it was like she, be, she had an ecstasy, and then every, every single day after receiving Holy Communion, she would have another vision. Right? It would follow that. And so her confessor asked her to write down uh, these visions, right, these conversations she was having with our Lord, and she did, and they um, eventually filled up five volumes, five books of writings, and, and they're, be, they're available today, the writings of St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi. Uh, the first uh, several uh, volumes just deal with her conversations with our Lord, and one of them, uh, one entire book, is devoted to her dark night of the soul. That would be, that would be described in, at length by John of the Cross. And he was, uh, he was born in 14 or 15, I think 45, and Mary Magdalene de Pazzi was 1566. So he's about 20 years ahead of her, uh, describing these mystical experiences, in which she, she, she experienced very much. Um, in one vision, our Lord uh, offers her a crown of thorns or a crown of roses, and she chooses the thorns. And um, interesting, our Lord gives her the crown of roses anyways. And she gives it back, and then he gives it to her, and then she pushes it back, and he gives it to her, and finally he gives her the crown of thorns. And then once she has the crown of thorns, she wants to give it back. And he won't take it this time. So there's, it's, it's, there's very interesting, these, these um, uh, visions of the saints, you know, sometimes this almost uh, playful uh, uh, attitude with our Lord, but that's what he wants, right? That's what he wants to have with all of us. Um, and the trouble is, if we're not prepared to receive him, he, he can't do that, right? He can't relate to us in the way that he wants to. Um, and I've said this before, but that's why um, humility is so important in the spiritual life. You will never advance further than your humility uh, will allow you to go because humility is honesty, right? Humility is being honest about yourself. And if you are not honest with somebody else about who you are, they cannot have a relationship with you and vice versa. If somebody is not honest with you, how can you relate to them? Because they're, they're, they're being a pretend person. And so it's the same with us and God. Because we don't know who we are, because we don't know what we really are, he cannot have a deeper relationship than our honesty will allow us. 
Uh, and so that's why humility is, is so important. And St. Mary Magdalene de Patsy had that. And so she was able to have this very intimate, very um, even playful relationship with our Lord because she was honest. And this comes out in her other writings. One of the books, I think, is called Admonitions. And it was um, kind of these, these sayings about her dealings with younger women religious when she was their novice master. Um, and uh, so she, she's a novice master. She's dealing with all these women coming into the convent. And she's got a lot of practical wisdom in dealing with them. And her, her humility, in terms of her honesty, her perception, comes out when one of the novices, uh, you know, and we do this, we trick our minds. And, and the novice was like, oh, in order to be really humble, uh, in, in order to be really virtuous, I'm going to pretend to be impatient with the other sisters because then their opinion of me won't be so high, right? Everybody has a high opinion of me because I'm so patient. So I'm going to pretend to be impatient and have a low opinion. And, and so there's this like convoluted um, plan of this young novice to, to try to be holy. And uh, St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi says to her, um, what did she say? Sister, what you want to pretend to be, you already are. Uh, and others don't respect you as much as you think. Uh, so uh, very, very perceptive and very honest. And in fact, we could say almost a kind of rude, but it wasn't rude. She was just telling her the truth. And that's what an honest person, a humble person is able to do. They're able to just see what is true and state it plainly without any kind of pride or anger or whatever it may be. They're just saying, um, I'm sorry, this is true. Right, that, that's, that's what you're thinking and convoluting in your head. It's all a bunch of baloney. Just accept what you are, right? Be more humble. Um, <clears throat> so that is all of us, right? All of us are, um, can aspire to a greater sanctity by aspiring to a greater humility, which means just being willing to accept the truth wherever you find it, whether it's about other people or about myself or about my ideas or my abilities or whatever it is. Uh, so many people, when, when we are interacting with others, we, we, we are insulted or we're offended because we consider how does what the other person, you know, do, do or say make me feel, right? We should think, uh, is what the other person said or did, is it true, right? We should be looking for truth first, not feeling. That makes me feel, I can't believe they said that. Was it true? Oh, I didn't think about that. That should be the first thing you think of, right? Then you decide, okay, are my feelings right or wrong? So uh, eventually she would, she would have these ecstasies and, and uh, uh, she would go through the dark night. And again, God, God said to her, you know, you're going to go through a period of trial and it's going to be very difficult. And I will, it will feel like I've removed my grace. It will feel like I have removed my presence, but I will not. I will be increasing my presence, even though it feels like the opposite. And, and this, this is showing the, um, the primacy of our reason over our emotions, our faith in the words of God, as opposed to um, belief in what I feel and what seems to me to be the case. But no, we believe our, our Lord's words over and above our, um, you know, personal feelings. And boy, I wish the world could learn that lesson these days. Everything's about feelings. Um, so eventually she would, um, she died in 1607. Uh, she was age 41. Uh, she was canonized um, in 1669, uh, and uh, I think in, the, in her canonization process, her, her body was found to be incorrupt. Right? Uh, so, uh, you know, these saints, th this is our patrimony, and um, it's been remarked or noticed that, um, you know, the, the great saints like, like uh, the mystics, Mary Magdalene de Patsy, um, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, uh, there's a progression of sanctity as the world progresses. St. Vincent de Paul, uh, Louis de Montfort, Alphonsus Liguori, uh, the, the, these great saints are coming on because a foundation has been laid. Uh, we look at the early church. We didn't have saints like Mary Magdalene de Pazzi in the early church, but we had martyrs. We had these great uh, individuals who gave their lives and shed their blood for Christ for 300 years, showing the power of, of the truth of the gospel. Following that, we had St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, Gregory the Great, right? The, the, these fathers of the church who developed the theology. Uh, following that, we had the, the beginnings of the foundings of the, of the, of the orders, St. Benedict, right? The founding of the um, um, Western, Western monasticism, uh, the desert mystics. Uh, and then we, we progressed to um, 
uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, kind of laying the foundation for the social order uh, of, of Christ. And then we, we, we proceed to these mystics in, in, this, in, the, um, uh, in, the, in the church. Uh, and they're, they're all building on each other. Uh, we, we look at the writings of Teresa of Avila and, and, and John of the Cross and others, and they're constantly quoting the fathers of the church. They're looking back with respect and admiration on those saints who've come before. And that happens all the way up until our modern era. When we don't see saints like this today, why not? Because we've rejected the past. If you look back with suspicion upon the church, if you look back and you disagree with the foundation that was built to give us what we have, what do you expect? You, you think God's going to build on that? So that is a problem with the, with the modern church, not the modern world, the modern attitude in the church, which is that we're going to do something different than what we've done before. We're not going to continue the traditions of the past, but we're going to rebel against them. And, and, and what's the result? I mean, what's the last great saint we had? St. Padre Pio, right, the stigmatist. And he would never say, uh, he would never say the Novus Ordo. He never said it. Uh, he, he accepted those traditions which have come from us in the past. Um, so this, 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 this should really resonate with us. This, this should really be something that we, 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 we think upon. Uh, the sayings of the ancient fathers were not uttered without reason. It is by accepting the past, building upon it, that God is going to build the, the great saints that we need for today. Uh, so let's meditate upon that and ask St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi uh, for intercession in, in growing um, um, our own humility and honesty before God. God bless you all in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.